come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, Hi. where a movie talk show podcast comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. In our quest for total world domination, you can help us out with it by going over to wherever you found us and hitting that like or subscribe button. All of that stuff helps us get found by other freaky people like you. Who are into the same oh, freaky oh. stuff? It's that kind of nice. I think it is that kind of nice. <laughs> it seems like that kind of nice. Gentlemen, shall we? <laughs> oh, oh. All right, so uh, tonight, oh, first of all, we should introduce ourselves. These are the people who are talking to you, the internet radio superstar. Sean. Holly. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Colin. Colin, what sexiness do we watch tonight? Sexiness. Sexiness. Yeah, that's right. This, the what sexy adult movie. And I say that as like something made for adults. Like a mature, a mature movie. Yeah. Like you're not taking yeah, the kids right. this movie. Right. What do we watch tonight? Hide your kids. Hide your kids. Hide your, maybe hide your wives. I don't know. I yeah. mean, if we're in hide your daughters. <laughs> yeah. Hide your Nancy Allen's. There you go. Uh, we watched the movie called Dress to Kill. Ooh, from the year. 1980. Directed by. Brian De Palma. Uh, and starring? Uh, Angie Dickinson. A panoply of actors. Angie Dickinson, Michael Caine. That's how you went with first? I don't think she's first billed. I think uh, Michael, Michael Caine? Caine is yeah. first. Yeah. Okay. Michael Caine, Angie Dickinson, Nancy Allen. Um, uh, how long was that? That was a minute 26 on our Instagram. I put any guesses on how long it would take Sean to do a Michael Caine impression. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For the record, it was a minute 26. I just said his name. Maybe I affected an excellent voice, but I just said his name. He did. Bam, you nailed it. All right. Thanks. So I think this There's is... There's more Dennis Franz coming. That's the one I'm going for. There we go. Yeah, yeah, waiting for Dennis Franz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not the part of Hey, fuck you. It was, it was an unexpected one. I was I was thinking this whole thing was going to be Michael Caine impressions, but no. Out of left field. Oh, we We're going to get some Franz. NYPD blue. Who uh, are you fucking? <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, it's a, so it's a Brian De Palma movie. We did, I think, one other Brian De Palma movie. Say, no, what two. have we done? This is the third. We put him on the wall with oh, this. Nice. Uh, thanks to MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Free Show Wall of Fame, has so, uh, identified yeah. Brian De Palma because we watched uh, Body Double, Body and, Double. Uh, and Phantom of the Paradise. I was not here for other Neither was I. Oh, man. I know. You guys are missing out. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. See, this is what happens if you wait long enough to bring a director's movies back to the Saturday Night Free Show. It's like brand new. Right. Fresh for <laughs> Okay. Exactly. Um, all right. Other, what other diploma movies have people done? Uh, probably. Mission Impossible. Yeah. Mission Impossible <laughs> would be like, or uh, The Untouchables. Sure. Oh, yeah, The Untouchables. Um, but, I mean, like, my preference is the Sisters. stuff from, yes, well, Sisters, right, um, uh, nobody remembers Obsession, uh, Dress to Kill, Blowout with uh, John Blowout. Travolta, uh, Body Double, and uh, then I think uh, nobody remembers the bonfire of the vanities, do they? I yeah, heard it before, before, but I think it's because I you was like, I've it. only heard about it from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a huge <laughs> bomb and a uh, critical got a drubbing. What is even that about? What is even? Uh, jur- what is journalism. <laughs> yeah, I <really> <laughs> that, that doesn't sound... <laughs> Sounds like there's a lot and more Washington to it. And okay. stuff like that, yeah. Okay. Journalism. Say the title again. The Bonfire of the Vanities. Journalism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Casualties of War was a movie that put uh, Michael J. Fox in Vietnam. Um, I mean, he's been doing stuff like... Okay, so that was basically the thing. Brian De Palma, um, in the beginning, uh, Phantom of the Paradise... Oh, Carrie, of course. Can't no, obviously. Carrie. Jesus. Uh, That's what I was waiting for. I was like, are we even going to talk about it? Is that too mainstream for you, pal? Saying, no. <laughs> we get into it sometimes. So we're just like, what else did they do? Oh, Jurassic Park. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Silver? Who? What? Yeah, what? Well, he had, was, uh, yeah. he had a... Um, War Horse? <laughs> I guess he was known as being like a thriller director. Yeah. And then he moved out of thrillers and into comedies and war films and Mission to Mars. He did Mission to Mars, right? right? And then I think later year, or later career, he moved back into thrillers. Um, Femme Fatale with Antonio Banderas was one right. of his uh, passion, which I don't think a lot of people saw with uh, Rachel McAdams. And Anumi Rapace was a recent one. Um, so he's still working. Domino, I think, was his last one with Nicholas uh, Nikolai Coster Waldau. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So he's still doing movies, but now they're like, you know, basically foreign funded and, and don't get a whole lot of play. But oh, he did the Black Dahlia? Yeah, the Black Dahlia. Yeah. So that movie was such a disappointment. I hate, I don't, it was. It, it was, was such a disappointment. He had like a kind of a hit and miss kind of track record, but yeah. back in this era, it's like Brian De Palma was basically, well, I don't know. I mean, it was controversial, I guess, because what I remember is that, um, the main criticism of him was that he was ripping off Alfred Hitchcock. Mm. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, seriously, like, that was all the criticism was, like, everything that Brian De Palma does, Alfred Hitchcock basically invented, he invented the language, and Brian De Palma just copied. Um, is this true or false? You just watched this movie? I mean, I can see the influence, but I, I wouldn't say, like, a copycat. Like, no. oh, yeah, everyone's kind of taking bits and pieces. You take bits and pieces of whatever your experience is yeah. and, you know, who you I like, mean, I got more. Stuff. I got more Jalo than... Yeah, Hitchcock. definitely more... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, obviously, uh, because, um, you know, when we say Jalo, that's the Italian uh, thrillers that uh, Dario Argento is generally known for, but he was known in Italy as... The Italian Hitchcock. The Italian right. Hitchcock. Uh, yeah, so. I, I understand that. <laughs> I, mean, if, 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 I mean, you could sit here and say, like, well, everybody's in Hitchcock. Well, that comes from Hitchcock. Well, sure, well, but you're using it Yeah, it's the same argument. That, it's the same argument that every modern author is influenced by Mark Twain. You know, like, you can trace it back to somebody sure. always. Yeah. 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 Well, depends, He's like, like the guy who invented the language of, of cinematic suspense, Alfred right. Hitchcock. Right. right. So... I mean, there's more, I guess, that, that we're probably going to get into as we uh, talk about this movie and some of the other movies in De Palma's career. But, um, yeah, I mean, he made these, um, you know, they were, uh, I don't know if you want to, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> we said that this was a, a uh, an adult movie. Is this a sleaze? <laughs> Did he bring, like, a layer of sleaze? It's an erotic thing. Yes, but I didn't, I didn't feel sleazy about it. And we've watched some sleeves. Yeah, opening scene, I wondered where it was going, because our very first scene is, like, masturbating in a shower, and then like, slash murder, like, not sure what's happening. But I was like, okay, I'm not sure where this movie's going. And we're talking about, like, even that scene, so that scene is shocking. I think it, if you watch it, it now, yeah. Oh, yeah. you yeah, probably it's, it's saw it then. It's alarming. The version that we watched is the one that's uh, widely available on video. This is the European cut. Okay. okay. The yeah, one that, really. that, sh that showed in America, obviously, was shorter. It was minus uh, certain uh, shots and angles. I can figure out which ones. That were like, holy cow. We're, like, we're doing close-ups of... Uh, full bush. Uh, yeah. 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 Full bush. Like, close-ups. Yeah. I mean, like, you don't see this yeah. in any kind of... So, th I was like, like, why would you even think that this was a thing that you could do in the 80s? And I just have to, like... You know, I mean, obviously, you had, like, the whole free love generation of the 70s was kind of dying out. But there was this kind of, and the whole movie looks like this. It looks like centerfold photography from, yeah. like, a Playboy magazine. Like, yeah, the whole does. movie kind of. There is a grittiness to it. I wonder why Playboy recommended it. Gritty or, like, a, it's like a gauzy, all the lights diffused, and it kind of has that, like, perfume commercial kind of, yeah. you know, like. You know, it's like there's a softness to it. Yes, there it's is a softness. It's a 70s key party softness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the music's very delicate. It's by Pino DiNaggio, who, you know... Pino. Pino. Pino DiNaggio. Pino. Pino DiNaggio uh, did work with Dario Argento yeah, on uh, the movie Trauma. So, you know, eventually they were... But he... What an ancestors <laughs> community. <laughs> well, because there's a scene, I think, when we were talking about uh, uh, Dario Argento's uh, Tenebrae. Were you guys here for that? Yeah. Yes. Wait, there's, there's a scene there. in that where... Um, uh, there's a character in the foreground. They bend over, and the uh, the killer is standing right behind. It's a shock reveal, right? You know, like right. And that scene is in Tenebrae, which I believe was um, I think that was eighty one, eighty two. And in De Palma's Raising Cain, he has that exact same shot. And it's like, okay, did he come up on this with on his own? Did he steal it from Dario Argento? <laughs> you know, it's like these guys are in such the same headspace. Right. Of, right. You know, the, the Hitchcock influence, they, it's possible that they both independently came up with this exact same shot. Well, sure. Oh, yeah, it's always <laughs> definitely oh, yeah. possible. Because when you're trying to figure out ways, when you're trying to figure out ways to do this stuff, you, you're working in similar areas, you kind of, I mean, you think along the same lines. It's possible. Right. So, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely always possible. Yeah. And he has... Um, 
I guess there's uh, the other thing. I mean, De Palma, there was a movie made about him recently, a documentary. Uh, Noah Baumbach uh, interviewed him. Oh, for, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that he always kind of – because De Palma is like uh, one of the – the group of filmmakers that included like George Lucas and uh, Martin Scorsese, and they were like the first like film school filmmakers, right? right? Uh, Coppola and you know Spielberg and you know right. all these guys. That's right. the group. What's the fucking group's name? I yeah. forget it. Every uh, I know. Zotrope, Zotrope. There, there it is. Well, I don't think they were all... Well, not, not all of them not were Zotro, them, but they but were they all... But they were the group. Right, but then they yeah. all came up during that time. I mean, yeah. there was... Um, was Brian De Palma, did he go to, like, New York Film School or something? Like, I think he was U.S. Or was he U.S.? Yeah, yeah, but it feels like he's very New York. But it feels think, like it. Yeah, but that, that may just be his movies. With Martin mm-hmm. Scorsese, but... I mean, I remember, you know, the, the casting session for Carrie and Star Wars overlapped, right? When actors would go uh, in for one, they were basically auditioning for... For both. What a fucking world. Yeah. Can you imagine that waiting room? Where one, one side's the door to Star Wars, the other one's the door to, the door to Carrie. Can you imagine who's sitting in that fucking I room? I want to be in that room. That's yeah. a good room. And they're all like, you know, telling her, this is the movie that I'm working on right, right. now. I'm like, what do you think about this? Well, she imagine Harrison Ford, just... and she's like, what are you working on? <laughs> fucking space movie. Uh, <laughs> little would he know. Yeah. Um... I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, okay, so Dress to Kill. Um, uh, there was a, a movie, uh, I think it was on our Species episode. We were talking about, like, uh, basically now they don't make movies for adults. Yes. Right. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, I got it. Colin, Colin's got one. <laughs> Colin, like one of the yeah. It's a Colin. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, when we say it's a movie for adults, I mean, obviously there's the expectation, I think, that you just kind of have, a, like, a quote-unquote adult movie is going to have lots of uh, nudity right. and sex in it. But... To me, it's like, and I don't know if you agree with this, there's like, sex is used as a psychological motivation, like, you know, uh, for people's behavior. Like, right, yeah, lot, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. yeah. That is what is driving them in this movie. Yeah. And that's like, absent, uh, for the most part, from modern day films. Like, we won't go anywhere near it anymore, which is right. weird. <laughs> yeah, people are weird about it. Yeah. I mean, we're all, we've all got our weirdness about it, but I think that's... America's. Obviously, this is the European cut. The European cut, yeah. and now he's getting funded by uh, by Europe. Right. Um, okay, so um, this movie um, stars Angie Dickinson at the at the very beginning of this, and we see her yes. in this uh, shocking opening, uh, extremely revealing um, shower scene. Um, there's two things about this. One of them, I guess, we'll come back to. But uh, the second thing is the, the shower scene sequence and shooting it was what inspired Body Double. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of like, and so in Body Double, he actually shows kind of at the end of that movie, like how they, <laughs> how you shoot a movie with you know, like your star and then your your below the neckline Body uh, Double. Gotcha. gotcha. So I don't think that was a- actually Angie uh, Dickinson. She's although, taking some risks if it was. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Because I mean, obviously she was known as uh, you know not only being a consummate actor, but like unafraid of you know her body. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was in a movie that you should probably check out, which was. Big Bad Mama, the Roger Corman produced movie where she's like a, a, a 30s gangster. Uh, you know, she's like the wife, I think, of a, or a girlfriend of a gangster. But William Shatner and Tom Skerritt, uh, she screws them both. I mean, you got to see this movie. Right. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, <Set him> up. <laughs> um, and she was obviously on the, we were talking about the, the TV show Police Woman, which I think is where she got kind of really famous. Um, obviously she was in, uh, Rio Bravo, we were talking about, right, right. Yeah. Dial in for murder. Yeah, was she dial in for murder? She's in dial in for murder? I thought that was Grace Kelly. She's also in the movie. Okay, well, I don't remember. I don't know if it's Grace Kelly. Well, I... I could be wrong on that also. Anyway, uh, so there you go, maybe she wasn't. So, um... Anyway, so she, uh, is the star... Basically set up as the star of this movie, and, um, she has, um... Well, I guess, like... She has a, psych- a, a sexual issue going on in her marriage. Mm-hmm. Yes. And for that, she is seeing a psychiatrist, right. which so, is played by Michael King. So this opening, I'm kind of confused by this opening scene. Is this her fantasy, or is this someone else's fantasy? Oh, that's a good question. That yeah. is a good question. Because <laughs> we go from that right, right yeah. sex. Ooh. Right. Well, I'm going to say hers. Just because we're with her. But later, like by the end of the movie, I'm wondering if it's someone else. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. You know. Gosh, gosh, gosh. And we just happen to. Well, I mean, hey, the power of editing. Yeah, and, that, right. and then we just switch over to that. Good point. Right. Good I point. I think it's hers only because this is, I guess, my case. I think that she is sexually frustrated. We know this because of things that she tells to the uh, psychiatrist, and maybe yeah. this is some kind of, you know, because she's, like, looking at her husband, and her husband right. is distant and not, uh, you know, able Doesn't to see her. her, even though she's in the shower, because right. it's all foggy, you know, and then there's yeah. a guy in the shower... You know, and she he ends up raping her, I guess, in the shower, and then she wakes up. Or no, we don't even see her wake up from this. Uh, it just goes to sex. She's having right. sex, or her husband is having sex with her. Let's which, put it that way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is why, like, I don't know if we want to get into it now, but by the end of the movie, we're gonna find out like the other character who's having like a mental battle is this his fantasy and it's his own mental battle with you. Right. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, I think you yeah. can make a case for it, but yeah. I, but I think the way like what okay, we discussed is her. Yeah, if you can put a pin in there, we're gonna have to yeah. double back. I, like, on I think we might have to come back yeah. to that later, but okay. I just want to put that out there. That is a good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but uh, it's Colin's like, like, like I've been watching this movie for thirty. Years. I know. Yeah, I never did actually. <laughs> that never did occur to me. Well, I just here, assumed Colin. that was like, yeah. Okay, so then, uh, so she's basically like denied an orgasm in that scene. Yeah. That leads and she, her and to he the gets a nice little pat on the face. And yeah, and he, 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 he like good games her, but like <laughs> on her face. It would have been. <laughs> I would have. La- I laughed, but I would have laughed harder if like you know when you got to push off to get on the bed, right. he, like pushes off her face, like oh thanks, honey, and then gets <laughs> up. <laughs> it was just so like it was so demoralizing. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's like, yeah. I got what I needed. Bye, bitch. Like, that's how it felt. It yeah. was, it's like, hey, you oh. did good. And then there's that, good. like, uh, making a comment on, like, the uh, the over-familiarity of uh, married sex. long-term, married, long-term you know, sex relationships yeah. or whatever. Oh, sure. Um, she goes to, well, I, I guess we're also introduced to her uh, son, mm-hmm. uh, who's played by um, uh, Keith Gordon. He's, um, mm-hmm. you've seen him before. He was in uh, Carrie. Uh, or not Carrie, you sorry, Christine. Jaws he two. was in Jaws 2. Back to school with, with Brownie Dangerfield. He was. Uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> then he became a director, and, uh, you know, obviously we like the show Dexter on this show. He's done uh, uh, Dexter yeah, episodes. Yeah. Um, still working as a director. Uh, so he's her son, but, like, uh, what about him? Uh, what, what's his character? He's Peter Parker. Circuit science. <laughs> <laughs> that's blinking light science yeah, I think. it is, it is yeah. literally blinking light science yeah. it's like he's creating blinking light science at this point right like this is the origin of it in my head he's yeah like, this is it he's creating like a computer like a he created a circuit that will yeah. carry more information than has carried before he created One's a big old zero. flash drive <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 20 20 digit numbers it's yeah. like, like uh, it carry say. and hold it and, yes yeah so he's a tinkerer so this becomes important later on in the movie obviously as they're setting him up but right. basically she kisses him goodbye goes to see her shrink uh michael king and relays this like this is the problem that she's having with her relationship uh with her husband that she doesn't kind of feel um, you know, fulfilled, I guess. Well, she actually says that he's bad in bed. Yeah, they right. get pretty down to the nitty-gritty in this, which is also what makes this I think, an adult movie. Like, it's right. an adult therapy conversation it really about is. life and sex and the people you're with and stuff like that. I actually really appreciate that. It was, yeah, <laughs> it's just like, these are these are good questions. Like, these are these valid are... issues that people, like, regular people deal with. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she gets into the conversation with Michael Kane. She's like, well, do you find me attractive? Why would you stay it? Like they're and just like, asking and questions. Like to be honest, like I wasn't put off by her question, like her conversation with him. You know, I wasn't thinking like, oh, you shouldn't ask your shit. In my no. mind, I was like, I would, I would have those questions. No, these are the things I would have been like, what's wrong with me? Do you find me attractive? Like, do you find me attractive? Right. Like, help me out here. Like, I, I appreciated the realness of this conversation. Yes. Well, what did you think of his responses then? Because I guess that's the thing. Unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was in that initial uh, session. Well, because basically, I mean, what I think that's, uh, well, because we have the uh, hindsight of looking back after the movie's over, right. looking at his questions, but I also don't think, I think up to a certain point, that's an honest conversation between people, like, yeah, I don't, it's also but, hypotheticals in the show. Yeah, I joke about it, but I don't think it was that bad, because he still brought it back to, like, a clinical analysis. This time, he brought yeah. it back to yeah. the clinical analysis. Yeah, because I guess it's a thing, if your patient says, like, would you sleep with me, you know, his answer is basically, you know, it's like, yes. But he thought about it. 
Yeah. I, you know, love my wife, and, yeah. you know, it's like there's moral, ethical reasons why I'm He's like, as a do. man who is attracted to you, obviously, if given the opportunity in a different situ- situation, I would. But I am married. I'm happily married. I'm your doctor, so no. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, I get it. I'm good with it. Yeah. So, this leads us to the first of the big... Uh, well, I suppose this is like the centerpiece sequence of the movie. Uh, this is the art gallery sequence. Which, that was a long sequence of no talking. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh, a, yeah. But it was like, there was tension. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, lots of tension. Yeah, because it's, ch- it's a chase. For, I mean, this, and, is, this is... Both ways. This is in the Met, right? This is in New York. This is the Met. It looked like the Met steps. So look, it looked like the Met inside. Yeah, the the, 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 it looked like the Met steps. That's what I was going off of. We'll but, go with it until some. But she's just like, there's a long scene of wandering through and the different areas of this gallery. It is. And you get, I think you get so much, and like I said, no words said, but there's so much said yes. in this part, which is great. So much said without any words. Yeah, because no. there's yeah. like, there's, there's twists of, you can read her emotion like so clearly, like yes. scene to scene. This is, I think, like, this is great fucking acting. You yes. Know? Yeah. And I mean, it's great direction and great acting. Because we can tell, I mean, even at the beginning, just where she's sitting there, she comes in, she sits down, she's watching, and she's looking at the paintings. And she's remembering, like, oh, i got to bring the turkey and get the, yeah, whatever the grocery she's list. she's, like, staring at paintings and also making her grocery list. Right, yeah, nuts, <laughs> need nuts. Uh, she's also watching other, she's people watching, she's yeah. watching other people and the other lives around. They are, they have become part of the artwork for her. I, this is how I see it. Like, yeah. she's, she's finding she's, as much interest in them as she is the paintings yeah, around her. she's observing yes. art. Imitating life, life imitating art. Yeah. 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 And there's a little bit of like, you know, because she sees the two young lovers, you know, it's like, right. so this is something that she can't, she doesn't have, you know, it's already she had years ago. Sure. You know, and she's kind of watching them. There's also the parents who lose the kid or whatever. Yeah. The kid wanders off. A dude uh, wanders in and who tries to hit on a woman who's staring at a painting. Like, right, yeah. yeah. First time here? Yeah, 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 but she and you can like almost tell how she feels about yeah. all yeah. of these things as it's happening. Yeah. And you can tell what she thinks of the the pictures. The one of the, the ape. I'm sorry, I don't know what the uh, the, the, yeah. the title of that one is. Sexy ape. <laughs> it's got to be the sexy it was, ape. It was a gorilla doing the Jeff Goldblum Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, no, that was a gorilla doing the Burt Reynolds. There it is. On the bear That's run. what it is. That's what that was. That's what it is. That's what I got from yeah. it. I don't know about you guys. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's just, it's it's just cool. It's cool to when it cuts back to her. You know, like you <laughs> yeah. have your reaction when you yeah. see it. You're like, oh, and then you cut back to her, and she's like, oh, oh, <laughs> no, I need nuts. And then it cuts back to her again, so she can like she keeps looking at it, and then like has to, you know, just the shift in body language yeah. is like you she's, can read like she's like, no, I'm going back to the water. The, the woman watching yeah. it. Like, I feel like she's like, I'm uncomfortable, but I'm uncomfortable because there is a primal part of me that needs to come out right now, and that's and it's calling out to me right now. So maybe. And that's maybe. what she's feeling, okay. yeah. And then, I'm after here, that, guys. after she watches <laughs> that, or looks at that photo, a man comes in yep. and sits down next to her. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy... Uh, you know, it's like, is it, I mean, just the dynamic there where she's like trying to, is she trying to get his attention? See, that's oh, the yeah. thing. She's, she's so torn because she wants him to notice her and she wants him to flirt with her. But then at the same time, she's like, I'm married. So she goes back and forth between like, why aren't you looking at me? And then, oh, he kind of looked at me. I should show my ring to show him I'm married. But I kind of still want him to look at me. Like she, you can see the battle in her going. Oh yeah, more. because when she takes the glove off, I'm like, wait, I, I got. She wants him to notice, but she you got wants, your ring on. She wants gonna... both. She wants both. She's fighting. Yeah. Yeah. She is. <laughs> this whole movie's about eternal battle. This whole movie. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. She, the guy, takes off after seeing the ring. Supposedly, I don't know if we get confirmation of that, but she shows the ring. He leaves. So then she feels dejected. Mm-hmm. You know, right. it's like what you know. So she goes after him. She drops her glove, unbeknownst to her at this point, and then goes after trying to find the guy, and she passes him. And we get, like, this is this long... Uh, it's a you long know, scene. Yeah, it's like 15 minutes of this movie that is told in, I guess, what you would call pure cinema, right? You are telling a story without... You don't need dialogue. Just through the pictures and the movement of the camera and the acting alone. Pilot film. Yeah, almost. <laughs> yeah, accompanied by this, you know, right. uh, this score. Um, she loses the guy. The guy reacquires her. He chases her for a little bit. She and we say chase. It's just slow, uh, highlighted or uh, pinpointed by her heels that we hear. Of 
for walking and everything. Right. But it's, it is, it's, a, when we say chase, it is a, they're walk, it's back and forth through this area in the Met where you turn corners and there's other paintings and other people, but somebody could disappear behind it really quick and everything. So people are like disappearing and then coming across and sides, which mm-hmm. it's a theme that happens more later in the movie, right? mm-hmm. but this is, we're starting off here using it for tension right. in this. And I wonder if that's why the scene is so satisfying to me, because one of my weird things in life is I love the Foley of shoes. Like, I oh, love yeah, it. Yeah. I love the sound of shoes in movies. There's a really it's like my favorite thing. great scene in Brick that is solely, like, concentrates on, like, heavy footsteps. And it's really, mm-hmm. really, really great. Oh, and Point Blank, Point Blank with Angie Dickinson. And yeah, it's Lee Marvin. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> for, like, I don't yes, know. Yes, I remember yeah. that. It's in the trailers, yeah, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, just the sound of his footsteps as he's walking. <laughs> like, that's a man who's going somewhere. Um, Lee Marvin's always going. Well, I guess I guess we shouldn't dwell on the scene too long, but it's I like mean, they a did, but they did. Well, they but of, like, I think it's worthy of it. Yeah, yeah. and um, switching, you know, like because she wants him, she doesn't want. It. She's like offended by him. She's excited right. by him, yeah. and then right. she hates. And she kind of hates herself she's for being excited so by him. Yeah, very torn. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, at the end, she loses him. And he has her glove. He picks up her glove and toys with her. And a little he does, bit and that. he pu- puts it on, and it's like. Like, I get the joke. He's like, hey, found, excuse me, ma'am, found your glove, which totally, like, goes she past just, her. She just, like, runs away. <laughs> she does. Yeah. It's like, because I want you, but shock. I don't want you. Yeah, like, it was the it, shock. It is. Yeah, like, it he is breached her bubble, yeah, and yeah, it, it there was a moment there. Because like, oh. there is a difference between having that desire and it actually coming to fruition. Right. So mm. the actual touch is jarring to yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. And she does, I think, like, come back around. Like, okay, I do want to talk to the guy. And then she can't find him. And then right. she's trying to track him down. And she loses him. And then we go to outside of the Met, mm-hmm. where he's dangling the uh, glove out of a right. taxi cab but this one, she's she just throws her other glove on the ground. Like, Rich what are people. You doing? I know. She's like, well, what am I going to do with this other glove? Again. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point. Hey, is there a poor person around? Take my fucking glove. <laughs> we do <laughs> see. Someone else picks up the glove. And if you watch closely during the scene, I don't know if I should tell you this, this is maybe a spoiler, but you see a primary character in the scene, like, up close, right in your face as the camera goes by. That character is looking for, at what what's she looking at? Turns the head, I mean, in the camera move, does this. What's looking at the glove over there? I mean, it's like, oh. you, I don't know if you see it the first time. Or I, not, I didn't But, like, know. right in front of you. No, I, I did think not I missed that. It. No, yeah. that. It's one of those things. You know, like, you ever seen that video of the, whatever, the uh, the, the two teams that are passing the, the tennis balls or whatever back and forth, and then, like, a gorilla comes in, and nobody remembers <laughs> seeing the gorilla? <laughs> right, right, It's right. like that. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> right. But I, I suppose you also don't know what you're looking for at this point. You're focused on the background action, right. and you're like, there's characters moving in front of the camera or whatever, but this one is, like, significant <laughs> later wow. on. Um, so anyway, she gets in the, the taxi cab um, with this guy and has, like, this crazy intense uh, sexual experience with him in the back of a New York cab. Um, oh, God. Like, I forgot it was a New York cab. Who knows yeah. what that fucking thing? Oh, and, oh like, that makes and, it a little like, less making noises before anything even happens. Yeah, she <laughs> is. <laughs> She well, is into some it. Pent up uh, yeah, release right there, and then she accompanies him back to her. Or she, we we cut to yeah. She we do yeah. see her going into uh, his apartment. I like the way that DePaul shoots that scene because she's like her attention is looking around at all the people uh, who are unloading stuff and just around because right. I think it's like that's guilt. You know, or something. Like, is anybody, anybody see me do that? Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. Guilt, and I also think it's. Do you ever have those surreal moments where you're just like. You're, you're kind of like outside of your body where you're like, this is actually happening to me, but the world is still happening around me. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what it felt like to me. Yeah. You know? Does anybody else see this? It's like, when you're taking happening leave to me. of your senses yeah. and you're like, you're just going with it. Right. And so then we cut to some time later uh, in the evening and she awakens in the bed and she's like, okay, I'm going to get all my shit together, sneak out of the bed. And she's like, I'll write this guy a nice note. And uh, she goes into his drawer. This is shot great as well, because this is like we wake up on the bed and then we, because it leads to a hallway. And so we're just, we slowly pull out. It's great movements in his camera work, because yeah. it's pulling back and she's, she's collecting everything. She's getting dressed. It pushes in, pulls out, pushes in. And this is all 
they don't, this is a lot. They don't cut much in this, do they? Yeah. This is all one thing and yeah. until she sits down and starts going through stuff. Yeah. Like, in, that's beautiful, in too. In his interviews, this is the thing that De Palma has always, you know, I mean, I, I kind of agree with him. He bemoans the lack of, uh, er, 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 of the, I don't know, the death of cinema, but he says, basically, whenever you talk to filmmakers and they, like, how do you shoot a scene, they go immediately to, like, well, you gotta get coverage of the scene. He's like, I hate that word. I don't even know what the hell it is. It's like, Coverage is like a default place to put a camera to get like reaction. He's like, but you're not actually thinking about how to see the scene, you know? Mm-hmm. And when you watch his stuff, it's like he never just cuts directly between, right. you know, two people talking in a, you know, usual, uh, you know, over the shoulder manner. <laughs> you know, it's always like the camera's in some, you know, specific position or doing something. There was a scene with the, uh, in that apartment, the scene you're talking about. Where uh, where she's getting stuff together at the desk. There's a phone on the desk. I didn't notice it to be honest with you until like the way he like, he, he kept moving in made the phone the center piece. It of made the it shot. alive because I'm, I'm like <laughs> it's gonna ring. Something's gonna yeah because yeah. it, it he's it's so good at putting taking that tension and he puts it in an object. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he put it in that phone and so you're waiting on him like all right, what's gonna happen with the phone if she's doing this because it's such a quiet and dialogue free scene. He's like all right, is there something Someone's got to break this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what, is what I was thinking in my head. And then he goes into the phone. And you're like, is that going to do? But it didn't ring. It didn't I was ring. surprised. Yeah. She makes a call. She tries to call her husband, I guess. I'm like, what the hell is she going to say? She hangs up on him. And then she writes this note, you know, thanks for the great afternoon. And in his desk drawer, <laughs> this, the movie I did not all of a sudden takes a turn. <laughs> yes. First twist. <laughs> Holly, what happened? Well, some light reading in his desk drawer. Mm. Um, a <laughs> lab results. From his STD panel, mm. confirming he has a venereal disease. I like the way that it's got an exclamation mark. You have a venereal disease. It's the like, camera focuses on that. It's like, please call our office immediately. <laughs> yeah, emergency. Danger, danger. So it turns out that, uh, I mean, like, obviously her afternoon of indiscretion has now possibly put her in a position where she's contact or contracted this disease. So then she flees to the elevator uh, to leave. And then she realizes something else. She forgot her wedding ring back in his apartment. It's a nice <laughs> ring. Nice, big it's a ring. Nice ring. <laughs> big old rock. And it was like, what the hell? I mean, this just keeps getting worse, right? It's the compounding of, like, the, uh, oh, and the kid, who, uh, the little girl who comes in. Oh, the, yeah. The the at her. She's like, you did yeah. something wrong. Because she's just look at Angie Dickinson's face. It's like she's, like, being stared at by this little girl. Yeah, and but she, she almost knows. comes to tears. Yeah, yeah, she's staring up in that. <laughs> the innocence of the kid. So she's like, okay, fine, I'll go back up to the apartment because I have to, you know, I guess, you know, talk to this guy and <laughs> get this ring back. Mm-hmm. And she opens the, the doors to the elevator. And what happens? <laughs> she's attacked. She's attacked by? By a blonde. In a trench coat. In a black trench coat with sunglasses. The black gloved killer. There. Yeah, and a go. straight That's razor. A oh, big old straight <laughs> razor. This, yeah, is, this is a big shiny. one. shiny. Yeah. Big and shiny. <laughs> you say it's a black gloved killer because yeah. this is, uh, you know, uh, 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 an archetype that's uh, made famous by the uh, the Italians in their Jalo movies. Right. It's like, that's why this kind of, it feels like this is the American version of the Jalo. Yes. You do have black trench coats. You got the black gloved killers. You have. Man dressing woman. You have, uh, like. Psychosexual, um, mm-hmm. you know, motivations. You have a certain layer of sleaze. You have police involvement. who are generally ineffective, and you know, the, the 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 protagonist that has to become their own detective. Yes, and all this stuff. Um, I, I don't know if that's that. intentional or not. I don't know if he was seeing those Italian movies and was inspired. I mean, we're saying they're all inspired by Hitchcock, so uh, there you go. But anyway, slash to ribbons. That one hurts because the first. Attack like or the, yeah. you know catches her in the palm of her hand. She tries mm-hmm. to defend herself like oh, yeah. terrible, and she's yeah. slashed to death. And of course, she's wearing all white. So. Yes, yeah, and wearing all white. She's blonde, so the red really pops, and she's yeah. getting in the neck and sides. And it's brutal. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. Like that is not a nice attack. Not good. No. <laughs> okay, I think at this point I should lower the spoiler spoiler warning thing. Here. Because I think okay. in order to talk Spoiler about this hammer. movie, we're going to have to, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, so our, <laughs> yeah, our listeners should know by now, but yes, we're going to spoil yes. the hell out of this movie. Yeah, so if you haven't seen this movie and we've intrigued you so far, this now would be the, the time, time to, to stop and go watch yeah. it. And it was a that. video game. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Different movies, sorry. So <laughs> three and two, 
And one. Okay, so uh, I guess, you know, and this may be not... Uh, uh, um, so the abrupt exit of uh, Angie Dickinson mm-hmm. from the movie at this point uh, mirrors a Alfred Hitchcock, famous Alfred Hitchcock movie. Um, do you think that this movie has uh, a, a huge debt to Psycho? <laughs> Is this Brian De Palma's Psycho? <laughs> well, <laughs> it starts in a shower. Oh, okay. like we've got a we've got a prominent shower scene. We she dies early on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the big star is ejected or killed like twenty minutes in. There is a scene at the end of this movie where a psychiatrist is explaining the motivation of the. I mean, it's like right on. It's yeah. like that is the, a scene uh, from Psycho. Oh, yeah. It's like the uh, the trans the the trans situation. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. the Palma yeah. did this, right? Like this was his thing, and I guess this is why there was such criticism about like his methods, uh, his films, because obsession with John Lithgow, Lithgow and uh, Geraldine uh, Bujold was basically a paraphrase of Vertigo. This is his psycho uh, yeah. body double is it's his it. rear window. You know, it's like wow. I mean, blow out is uh, blow up. But I, you know, he only takes a little piece of it and kind of changes it. But uh, you know, Shit. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I see where. Yeah. So because you then are going to have an investigation that takes place uh, with the surviving. You know, usually uh, in Psycho it was uh, Marion Crane's sister. Right. You know, in this, it's going to be her, her son. son. Um, and the Allen. Yeah. Is. Uh, runs into this situation ends up being the back half of the movie. So how does Nancy Allen get involved in the movie? She is... Witnesses the murder. Yeah, she's in the building with uh, a quote-unquote friend of hers. A John. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, who immediately wants, because they're waiting for the elevator, so when it comes down, um, and Angie Dickens is in it, the dude sees it and immediately books out of the building. Right. But... Uh, Nancy Allen is... Picks up the murder weapon. Well, she's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as you do. Piano. Shock. And I uh, love the way this is shot as well, because it's, it's slowed down. Kind of like when everybody says, like, it's happening in slow motion. Right. Whenever something dramatic or an accident happens, something like that. This is his version of showing that. Nancy Allen, it all slows down. And she's taking in this very gruesome scene she's seen mm-hmm. as Angie Dickinson is, like, reaching for her. She can't believe it. Also, the killer is still in the elevator. That's a great shot. And it, the, the, that is a great shot. The whole thing, because then, like, he's waiting on the side. The door's closing. His hands going down with it. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. yeah. She sees him in the in the yeah. mirror in the corner of the elevator. I mean, and this is that's basically the end of this fifteen minute dialogue free, uh, you know, right. sequence, which is you know all told just by pictures. And like, yep. this is a short film inside mm-hmm. the movie. And it's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we get the like the mid movie scene, which is going to change the pivot of all these characters, brings everybody together in the police station. Uh, Nancy Allen, the hooker, is being interviewed by Dennis Franz, the police uh, guy, but for like um, you know, or no, he brings in Michael Caine first, the psychiatrist. Yeah. Why? Because Why? Well, because uh, what's your name? Nancy. Katie. Kate. 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 Kate was uh, his patient. Yeah. Yeah. And so, while well, he believes that maybe the killer may also have been a patient of the mm-hmm. doctor, right. because he has a prejudice against the mentally ill, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, he knows Michael Caine's been also, besides his like regular in office patients, he helps at the um, what the psych ward, the the mental hospital. Yeah, he also Bellevue. Sees yeah. Bellevue. Yeah, he also sees patients from there. Yeah. So Jen, Dennis Franz's working theory is that one of Michael Caine's patients uh, killed uh, Kate Miller. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's also pressuring the uh, hooker, right? Because it's like, well, you had the murder weapon, yeah. you had opportunity. Right. You're telling us that there was this woman in the, you know, yeah, elevator. Your, your only witness disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. The blonde woman you talk about, she's not around. Like. It just all sounds like a story. And yeah. the the son is also here, and he's using his technological know how to basically record and listen in on this conversation. So they all have they all have access to the same information. Yes. So Michael Caine does actually get a call from the murderer. Yes. Yeah. On his voicemail, and the murderer identifies himself herself as Bobby. Yes. Uh, who is a transsexual patient of his, mm-hmm. right? who says that uh, basically because 
Dr. Elliot is not helping with uh, getting a sex change operation. Right. He, he did not uh, sign off on it. He said, no, this is not happening. Now, question. This is the moment I knew exactly who the killer was. Okay. Like, anyone right. else? No. <laughs> anyone else? No, I was an idiot this whole... I mean, like, no. even, even going by the law, if you have a movie with four people in it... <laughs> right. One of the people... <laughs> I knew exactly uh, who I was right. Yeah, unless it's like, oh, fuck, it's a meat and cat on the boat. It's not okay. one of those four people. <laughs> I, know when, I, I know when you figured it out. Because I looked at you and said, is it? Is it, is it five words? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it, I, I was like, it's okay. I'm like, oh, good word, John. <laughs> okay, so what, what was it that, uh, that tipped you off? I knew it was clearly a man that was dressing as a woman. He, they said that on the on the right. message. And it was um, obvious. And that, just, that was the yeah. killer. They basically just admitted it. And he did not go to the police. That was it. Yeah, because it's like, why is... Because yeah. that's what I was... You know, I guess you're thinking about it. It's like, what is his moral a- obligation if you have a patient who says, I stole your razor, I'm going to do something, mm-hmm. you know? And then it's like, this woman ends up dead. It's like, okay, I think that my patient killed this person. Yeah, like, you literally have the evidence on your... I was about to say voice now, but answering machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right, Collins. 1980. Yeah, answering machine. I was like, mm, he's killer. Well, he plays the movie. Well, I mean, obviously, the, the, the voice on the machine sounds absolutely nothing like my voice. Right, yes. So that's throwing you off. Um, the, uh, he's basically. <laughs> Oi, you wouldn't give me a sex change. <laughs> and we're going to have a word about it. And they keep on. Um, Basically, uh, I lost my train of thought. So. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll, <laughs> pain. we'll do that to people. I'm sorry. Well, because I was thinking, uh, the, the, when you go back and watch the movie, this is actually laid in through the use of mirrors, right? Mm. In the very first mm. scene, whenever uh, Kate says, you know, would you sleep with me? He looks in the looks mirror. Up, he, looks yep. up, he looked up into a mirror in that point. Yeah. The one on the wall, the right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And you don't really, I mean, did you read that as Not at that moment. Right. Because he's just thinking. Because it takes him a second. He's like, hmm, i got to think about this. Mm-hmm. So when he's pondering that, he looks into the mirror. The Even though there's that, a musical sting that, like, lands right on the, that moment. The fact that he looks in the mirror, like, okay, this is significant. I'm not sure how yet, but it's significant. Mm-hmm. And then when he was listening to the message, his reflection in the glass. The, yeah, like the cabinet. he backs into it looks he, at he, the... You see the reflection, like, okay, his reflection, this is something. Mm-hmm. And then just like, mm-hmm. fucking I know it. Yeah, because it ends up uh, they play fast and loose with this reveal. As far as yeah. because there's there's an element that the that the Palma hasn't uh, uh, alerted you to, even as you're trying to figure it out. Because I think maybe that was the thing that that threw me off was that um, uh, Nancy Allen at one point is chased by Bobby uh, yeah. through the the subway station, mm-hmm. right? And then when she gets to the end of the subway station, Bobby is there. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, how the hell did she get there so fast? So it's because they haven't told you. This is a reveal at the end. There's a policewoman who's been tailing her who happens to look exactly like Bobby the Killer. Yep. So <laughs> it's like there were two of them. Yes. It's like, oh, because oh. I'm yes. like, this doesn't check out. I don't. I can't. You know. Yeah. Um, you're thwarting my logic here. Right, in the that got yeah. me. The, that did get me. That, I was like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> right? That got me. I thought the dude that she had the affair with earlier on looked like the looked like Bobby. Like I, I for beginning off, I thought that was the guy. The guy in the wig. I'm like, wait, isn't this obvious? Like, isn't the guy she? I thought oh, he was attacking her. That, that, was, that my, was my first thought. That oh. was my second. I was like, if I'm wrong about Michael Caine, it's going to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. Thought, but then when they didn't follow up on him, like, that's right. just, okay, they're not going with that. Okay, so that's, he was just a throwaway. Right, that's, yeah, that's so dumb. he was yeah. just, okay. Yeah. Whole thing. yeah, but Bobby is present at the Met on the stairs, like, up close. Yeah. And I don't think that actually is Michael Caine. I think that's why they're also not playing fair. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah, not. It's not. It's I not think it's only it's Michael like, Caine in the wig in the office. I think he yes. is an actual woman. Okay. No, 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 that's a dude. Is it a dude? That's got to be a dude. I almost think that the woman who we're told is the uh, the, the police woman Plays. is Bobby. I think. I, I could be wrong, uh, but I think that's the, her. The, the glimpses that we got, I'm like, I think that's an actual woman playing that. Even though I knew who it was supposed to be, mm-hmm. like, I think it was an actual woman. I'll bet a dollar on it being a man. Okay. I don't know how we're going to find this out. <laughs> but that, no, because that wig, the height, the facial structure looked like a man. It looked like the guy she had just had sex with. From the and they're trying to make it look a little bit like, uh, I guess, Michael Caine in passing, but, you know, just... So or at can... least something, trying to make them look right. off, different, yeah. what have you. So why is Michael Caine the killer in this movie? Um, he's also um, 
He's a transsexual who is frustrated in a way. Yeah. He is not. Um, uh, oh, their explanation was. Um, he, he, well, this is why he wants a sex change. Anyone else waiting for the doctor to say, get me the Ghostbusters? Anyone else? Mm-hmm. I mean, I kind of, <laughs> I was trying to think of a good line. But he was the mayor. mayor. Yeah. Was he was the mayor. And I was I think, trying to think of a good line to be like, I know who he is. Like, what's a good line for him? The whole movie, I was just like, get me the Ghostbusters. The whole movie. Somebody <laughs> get me the Ghostbusters. <laughs> get him Perfect out of here. Uh... Well, it, but it, it's more than him just being a transsexual. I think we're talking about like a case of uh, 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 you know, dual personality. Yeah, right. Like Norman this, Bates, right? There is like the, the that is what has to do more to do with this than it being uh, transsexual or transgender. Yeah, it is. Yes, he is a dual personality. Can't remember what the other personality is doing. Which I'm like, that's why you know when he goes to see the other doctor. Uh, Which is yeah. mind blowing now that I'm <laughs> looking back at this. Like I'm like I gotta watch this scene again. Yeah. So I will say this this like analysis of being transgender definitely dates this movie. Very much <laughs> so dates the movie. Yes. Something we we now know that there is not the psychological ramifications that they that they blame on being transgender yeah, is actually not accurate. Well, that, that's, well, right. That's why I wanted to make clear that it, <laughs> yeah. it is the dual personalities yeah. causing right. us not being transgender. Right. right. Yes. We know that now. Yes. No, because I think they pay some service to There's an old Donahue episode that yeah. comes up that kind of explains, like, uh, you know, transgender or transsexual, I guess, right. as they were known in the... Uh, in the 80s. Right, which works to their benefit because you think he's watching it because he has a patient. Right. But right. he's watching it yeah. for his own information. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he goes to, up this movie. he goes to right. see he goes to see what we find out later. In hindsight, we know is his doctor, right? But the doctor only sees Bobby, and then yeah. this is the first time that he's come as you know his masculine self. Fascinating. And it's like my patient has stole. Oh, you got to do it, what, Michael King. What do you say? Uh, my patient stole my razor. He's I threatened to kick you. Know, because of my... I can no, I can do it, Michael King. Okay. That's it. That's all I got. That's it. That's why it's the only thing I said. And in the meantime, there is, like, another... Uh, that, there again, I could tell by the way the doctor was talking to him. He was talking to him in almost a patronizing manner. I was like, there is a tone to him. He's not taking him seriously. Yeah. And at this point, when this goes along with when you said he didn't call the police, yep. he doesn't stick around to talk to Bobby. I'm exactly. like, this is yeah. kind of important. Because you're exactly. why don't, why don't we go right. back to my office and we'll make contact we'll with con- Bobby yeah. or something like that, which yeah, yeah, is yeah. in hindsight, you're like, okay, right. he's going to put him in their hypnosis something. or something. But it's like, yeah. you just, <laughs> people get murdered. You just stick around and talk to Bobby. Right. Yeah. does not. Um... Why is everyone so casual about that? Yeah, right? <laughs> so we don't find out until the, the, the shocking finale of this movie that it's actually Michael King, obviously. You know, astute uh, film watchers who have made guess this earlier. Um, but there's um, there's another uh, long suspense sequence that is done uh, through, the, uh, through the cab chase, the subway. Right, yeah. Where Nancy Allen... I think she's being pursued by Bobby, so she goes down into the New York subway. She tries to take refuge next to these guys who are like standing next to a, a, a listen to music, mm-hmm. and then they kind of get aggressive with her. There's this whole like who's getting on the train when she seeks the protection of a police officer mm-hmm. who yeah. doesn't believe her and leaves, and then of course the guys show up, and it's, it's wow. kind of like oh my, and this just keeps getting, and then the it killer does. shows well, up. Shot well, and then, <laughs> then when they're turning, looking both ways, they look one way, the killer. From the, in the background, cops on the train, then they turn and look that way. Yeah. Well shot. Yeah. Very well. And and then, I feel like we haven't, we haven't really gone over Nancy Allen's character. She, um, okay. she we, we mentioned that she was, she's a hooker, but she's like, she's like a high class call girl. Yes. She's like making she's, lots of money. She's making lots of money and she's using that money to like make investments in like art and, and like the stock market. And yes. She's not, and she's not a dumb girl. Like she's. No, this is yeah. uh, this is the uh, same as people who strip to get through uh, to make money because you know right yeah I always find that like characterization kind of disingenuous because I think there's a lot you know it's like this is kind of the, not so much a hooker with the heart of gold but like I I like the portrayal I like the mm-hmm. character but it doesn't really read as like real to right me. yeah <laughs> that seems like the the high it's fantasy. the dream yeah this it's is the, the dream the, the yeah. fantasy call girl yes um. Yeah. But yeah, so she's trading on the stock market and all that stuff. She's trying to... So her thing, at this moment in the subway, she meets up with the son character, the Keith Gordon character, yeah. because he has been following, quote-unquote, Bobby and saves her life from an attack by Bobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they 
you start like investigating. And what their goal is to get into the psychiatrist's office and get his appointment book because they think that the killer is one of his patients. Right, right. and they've narrowed it down because the kid has created a, a device. I mean, he set up a camera outside of the doctor's office, <laughs> hidden in his it scooter. It looks like a camera obscura. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It really does. It's a, you know, it's a camera in a box. The only other thing we need is a big whoosh right? yeah, as it goes off. But they, they're filming them. Uh, the patients as they come and leave, and they they deduce it down to well, it must be his last last patient because it's the last person. To they leave. see Bobby coming out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but they another, don't say that Bobby ever went in. I was gonna say another another confirmation that I knew that was Michael Kane because you never see her go in, and he had already said that he hadn't seen or spoken to Bobby. Yeah. yeah, but it was on camera. I was like, what? So right. Yeah. Yeah. And when they, yeah, and when they said, well, and she was the last person. Uh-huh. I was like, well, there's a problem. There it is. Okay. There yeah. it is. <laughs> I think I got it. Now. Yeah. So this culminates in a climactic scene where she's going to go in and try and distract Michael Caine so she can get the uh, the book. And he's watching outside. The kids watching outside to mm-hmm. make sure make sure yeah like, she's okay that she, everything's going according to plan at this point. She tries to seduce Michael Caine, which turns out to be the wrong thing to do uh, when you're dealing with a schizophrenic yeah. <laughs> uh, multi It turns on, turning him on is his trigger. Yeah. Yes, because <laughs> if the uh, male side of his dual personality gets aroused, Bobby does not like that. Right. Right. That because sounds familiar. There's almost like one other movie character uh, that has that same kind of uh, uh, motivation. That would be... Well, it's Norman Bates. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Only mother didn't like yeah, it. Right, like yeah, it. yeah. It's like, uh, okay, Brian. I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I kind of like it because he's, he's synthesizing it, but it's obviously an homage to yeah. Psycho. Uh, is, it, is it plagiarism, I guess, is the, the question that critics were wondering with at the time and kind of, I think, didn't give this movie a, its fair shake. Sure, yeah. <laughs> because they're yeah. like... Ryan, you just like, what are you doing? And this is yeah. naked, <laughs> naked psycho. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I feel like since he goes more in depth with like the psychological aspect, to me it feels like a different movie. It feels like a different movie. Yeah, like different movie. I, I wonder if he, if I had brought it up, if he would even have made the it, connection. It, it, I don't it know. Didn't, yeah, no, it, it didn't. Honestly, like until we st- until you brought it up and we started making the comparison, uh, I didn't really think about it. Yeah, because it just feels like a different movie to me. Yeah, okay. Because the way, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's also from like two different eras yeah. at this point. Right, yeah. So I mean, he, we've got a different technology, yeah. different yeah. events around. Different focus on the eroticism, yeah. obviously. Yes. You yes, know, yes, there's yes. different fetishes that Alfred Hitchcock and Brian De Palma have. Yes, you know, yeah. um, blondes and chatters. Yeah, blondes and showers. There you go. It unites the two men across time. It unites a lot of men, I think. <laughs> it also unites. Touché. It also unites us women in fear. Ah, that's very true. Oh yeah, I forgot we were talking about how, yeah, how, uh, how we were conditioned for yeah. stuff like this, and then Holly's on the other going, "This is terrifying. Yeah. This is not sexy." Men are conditioned to think like this is sexy. Not us. Uh, <laughs> women we're get attacked in the showers. Yeah. Yeah. We're attacked in the showers. Yes, we, we apologize for that. Holly has Thank to live. You. On that side of the I appreciate yes, very that. Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, so the, you know it's revealed that um, uh, uh, Michael Caine is the killer and he's shot Moody. And so then the movie keeps going. Uh, we get the explanation yeah. scene. It yeah, keeps I, going. It does keep yeah. going, and I I thought we were going to be done. And it, did it need to keep going? Well, I like the the final like wrap up of uh, the cops and the psychiatrist. That, yeah, that yeah. I love. Yes, that's Solid. great. I like that. Love I need that. answers. Yeah. Cause, yeah, we yeah. What we because, we didn't we should go over the scene. I suppose we need to go over the scene. It feels like it's the last scene you get with your characters, knowing they'll be like those four will be back for the sequel, mm-hmm. and you're like. You're waiting for that scene where at the beginning of the second movie where they get the band back together and like they have to come back together. Like right. this is the end before they break up and go apart. It's like, well, we finally did it. Yeah, we unmasked that monster. I know. Is it? Uh, is it not cheap or disingenuous to like to me? be like? Yeah, because it's like okay, now we're gonna explain to you why, like why you know right. it's like there was another police woman, right? Who was like the magic you. artist, like all right, you saw all that. Well, yeah. here, here's what here's actually happened. Yeah. Yes. Well, here's, I mean, we did need that because I needed to know who the fuck that woman was outside the window. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. needed to well, know. Actually, fires the shot that right, uh, right. Down the Michael Caine character. 
uh, the psychiatrist explains this is uh, his psychological state of mind and why he did what he did. And then we get a scene, which I thought was played for laughs, which was extremely uh, verbally graphic uh, about how a sex change operation takes place. <laughs> right. between. That was kind of funny. Also played for laughs. <laughs> Nancy Allen and Keith Gordon go to lunch. But it was, it felt totally out of place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's not. Yeah, because like, what are these was, two doing? This was not a comedic movie, and this part no. was just hilarious. But it, it shouldn't have been. Like, why? I don't understand. It was very out of place for me. I uh-huh. liked it because it was like it was a light thing at the end of your movie, kind of like to, you know. It's funny because she's describing penectomies and yes. castration right. and all this like in, in detail. And there's this horrified, like, pro-clutching old woman at the table behind them listening to the whole conversation. Yes. That's yes. what makes it, you it's know... It's funny. Like, it is it, funny. Oh, no, it's like... She, she <laughs> looks like... Horrified. She needs to like, you fan herself, herself down afterwards. I got the baby. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And it's shot in such a way. He's using the split diopter for these shots. And I like how he puts... Is the people who are talking are, are um, opposite of what they should be according to the 180 rule on frame. They are hard in the middle while the woman reacting and then the people behind Nancy Allen are featured. Just, yeah. I don't know who right. the other that's, one was. That's what's funny to me just in itself because like, there was nothing to notice about them. They were just eating soup. Like, yeah. There was nothing well, to notice well, about them. Also that I, yeah, and I also think, well, that may be because he absolutely wanted to shoot the kids shot right. that way. It had to be you balanced. Can't, had to be balanced. Right. You can't do it one way yeah. and then switch back over to the other side. So we're like, well, we'll just have our eating soup. And it kind of looked yeah. like Angie Dickinson, which I, yeah. I I thought in like a different wig. Oh. In like a darker hair. But she had a similar look. A yeah. kind of yeah. similar look. And I was just like, similar he's thing. not putting her back in there for some weird reason. <laughs> uh, kind of looked like her different like hairstyle, but she looked similar. And I was just like, huh. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But then it just keeps Oh, then it keeps going. Keep okay, going. so this is okay. So so Damn, we, we almost have, had it. Brother. There, there yeah. are two more scenes. One of them is uh, we see a, an insane asylum, a sanitarium, yeah. where Michael Caine is interred, and a, a woman, a nurse, bends over him. He strangles her to death to the cheers of all these gathered, yeah. uh, you know, patients on the upper floors. And then apparently starts, it's just. A cleared pure, out office building? Pure like, anarchy and yeah. this, like, yeah. weird... It's shot in a way because, like, I've watched enough Brian De Palma movies that he codes his dream sequences of certain imagery. This one is all foggy, and the, the lights are all pointed directly at the camera. This is also followed up. He keeps this going in the subsequent scene, yes. which is... Uh, he does, because the lights are right there. He yeah. brings the same lights over. It's okay. the same lights and the same foggy shit. Right. You know, like inside, uh, Nancy Allen uh, goes to take a shower. We get an homage maybe to Halloween. There's a steady cam shot that begins outside the house and wanders around the side of the house. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm like... Well, this was the other thing I thought about how, I mean, that you mentioned, because, like, Michael got loose from the wandering insane asylum. Right, yeah. Like, yeah. That was the other thing I was thinking of. But, yeah. It yeah, I was like, like, where did this movie come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, what are we doing here yeah, now? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and then we see Nancy Allen's taking a shower, and she sees the, uh, the shoes, the legs of the nurse... Mm-hmm. Which we know is Michael Caine has escaped, and then you know she's. I mean, this is a, a long, yeah, very yeah, slow long. motion. Uh, you know, suspense sequences like she's naked in the shower. What is she going to defend herself yeah. with? She's looking around the bathroom when she gets out to actually go and you know grab a, a straight razor from the cabinet. A hand comes out and, and slices her neck, her and it's like bam, uh, that was a dream. And she wakes up screaming, and Keith Gordon comes in to, you know, comfort her, and the music's going crazy, and then and cut to black. Credits. So, how effective was this? M- unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. Totally unnecessary. Yeah, this last part we didn't need. Didn't like, like it. I could have just ended at the police station, yep. and it would have been perfectly fine. Yep. Okay. I'm right. not, a, I guess I am against it, but I'm not like... I don't hate if, it. Like, it is, it's just it feels had, superfluous. No, if it had been real, sure, I would have yes. been okay with it. But well, the fact that it was a dream, didn't need it. Even if it had been real, I think we, 
I think we're wearing out our welcome at this point. Like, I think we yeah. dealt with everything we needed to dealt with that felt right with this yeah. movie and this story. Yeah. And going past it, it, like you said, it feels like a different movie. Yes, it does. Any way you slice it, it was not needed. It I would have, I would have been more accepting of it had it not sure. been a dream. Sure. Sure. So these scenes are, uh, you know, I think uh, De Palma maybe have maybe invented this final scene with uh, Carrie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Friday the 13th obviously ripped that off, I think, you know, very successfully. Ripped it off, borrowed it, whatever. <laughs> yep. And so this is like, you know, a thing that's happening at this point in time. And so he's doing it again. But my problem with it, I think the reason it doesn't work for me mm-hmm. is the the... So it's two scenes that basically are part of a dream, but the first scene is not from the perspective of the dreamer. This is what makes it kind of disingenuous, right? Because we're seeing Michael Caine escape from the insane asylum. Yeah. It's like, if you're going to make a, a dream sequence, it has to be like the dreamer is present in their own dream, you know? You're not dreaming about like what the motivation is somebody else, you know, escaping from an asylum. You're it's your perspective in the you know the second part of it. They're like okay, I get that, but like the fact that you did the two of these, it feels like you're cheating. Mm-hmm. That's why I don't like it. It's like you cheated me, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> not only is it a dream, but it's a dream that you tricked me because she wouldn't have been you know mentally anywhere right. in present right. in. The Michael Caine escaping from the asylum mm-hmm. scene. So that's why it's like, ah, you, ah, you just you stumbled over With it. With that in mind, back Circling to my original back. thought, whose dream was that in the beginning? Because now we're saying, you know, it's like, was, did, was it, did the Michael yeah. Caine character have a, uh, a sexual attraction for Angie Dickinson? And so he's dreaming about... I guess attacking her He's in the, the shower. He's the one attacking her, yeah. He, he could be dreaming about it because he knows the issues between yep. her and her husband. Right. So he can imagine the distance and the longing. It's her longing for him at mm-hmm. that point. Um, and then, so is he the man who comes in and ruins it? Michael Caine? That's... Or his, not 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 necessarily him, but his... Avatar. Or, his avatar. Well, his or whatever, urge or whatever, yeah, he, whatever yeah. he's fighting to... That whatever, what drives him to kill in the movie is this what is showing up in the dream to rape and kill Angie Dickens. I mean, I suppose that that argument has some weight because, like, we haven't, like, I don't understand, I guess, from her psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess it's just that she well, wants are, to be, you know, like. There are fantasies. Yeah. Right? There are, and I, I, I did consider that. Like, she's thinking. I don't want to cheat on my husband. What if someone made me? Right. right. Yeah. You know? yeah. I so will, it makes me think that maybe then it, it definitively would be her. I'm going with her. Yeah. I think it's her. I think it's her. 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 Yeah, especially because we end up, because we go with her in the next, yeah, I'll stick with her. I'll say it's hers. Yeah. It's all about the like, point of view. But again, we know that he cheats. That's what Yeah, that's, cheats. Very, yeah, that's very true. Movie. That's very true. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, there it is. Dress to kill. Dress to kill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go around the room and tell you whether or not we would recommend that you watch this movie. But first of all, we're going to uh, answer some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to have to summon the assistance of our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. You're not going to, like, talk to him like... Uh, no, I was going to ask him uh, <laughs> ask him to help me with my pick for next week, because I just remembered it's my pick. <laughs> <laughs> Igor, any suggestions? <laughs> well, the upside is we have... Uh, oh, shit. I just uh, realized that... Uh, oh, okay. I was looking at our mailbag. We, we do know who Bobby is. Okay. So, uh, uh, first of all... Uh, we want to let you know, or we actually ask that you uh, write in and join our, this interactive portion of our show by following along on our social media, on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show, on Twitter, at Sat Freak Show. You can email us, Saturday Night Freak Show, Yahoo.com, or follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, so, in addition to Brian De Palma being on the Wall of Fame, uh, MF Matt also lets us know that William Finley is on the Wall of Fame because he played the voice of Bobby, but it was uncredited in this movie. 
Uh, he was also the Phantom of the Paradise, okay. and he was Marco the Magnificent in Sean's favorite movie, The Fun House. <laughs> Why did you love that movie, Sean? <laughs> Sorry, Larry. <laughs> Lawrence. I'll call you Lawrence from now on. Uh, Nancy Allen is also on the Saturday Night Free Show. We watched three of them. Robocop. Robocop 2. Robocop 2. <laughs> Robocop 2. <laughs> All right, Andrew Robocop 2. Andrew's the kill. Andrew's the kill. There you go. All right, about Thanks. tonight's movie, Dress to Kill, Michael Whitaker says, Ooh, this movie looks like a movie my parents would have sent me to bed for. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> Bill Van Ryan says, Brian De Palma received some negative remarks from critics for the similarities between his work and the work of Hitchcock. Yeah, Do you consider yeah. Dress to Kill a Hitchcock cover version? And what about this movie would you say is uniquely De Palma? I mean, listen to the Stop, last yeah, hour yeah. of our podcast. The style think. is definitely De Palma. Yeah, the style, sure. the shooting, everything. I mean, the tools he has to, to do it are, are definitely different. Yeah, the tone, Hitchcock. the eroticism, like, it's, yes. it's De Palma. Like, there's certain elements of De Palma that, that are uh, dialed up a little bit, mm-hmm. it would yeah. say. Because I, I was going to say even like the voyeurism, but uh, you know, it's fetishized. But I think uh, uh, Hitchcock also does it. Oh, like Hitchcock totally does yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the split die after. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a technique, a little bit of the technique. Uh, Giovanni Regis's life says it feels like a dry run for the much better body double. The palm is just really going through the motions here and somehow making psychic psycho more problematic. Hmm. Yeah. We'll discuss it. Yeah. All right. Apple Leva says it may be in the vein of Hitchcock, but it's still an effective thriller. Green. Joe LaHoho says, unfortunately, the first time I saw this was with my mom and a friend oh. on HBO. Oh. I was 14, and the shower scene oh. was very uncomfortable. Yeah. Great movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, how, it's, how far did you get? Because yeah. this is yeah. it's pretty like you... After that first scene, you're like, well, am I going to stick with this with my mom, or am I going <laughs> to bail at this And that was probably the R-rated version. Probably. Okay, probably, probably, probably. I'd be like, well, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even say a word. I'd be up and just Get walking up and upstairs. Like, just the uh, Irish goodbye. Uh, so no, I'm a small young child of a young man. <laughs> I'd be staying there. Mom, you go to bed. Yeah, I mean, your mom's <laughs> not sending you to bed. Right, you know? yeah, no, I would, I would hide. I would move myself back from the TV and maybe hide behind by the side of the couch a little bit, yeah. just so they forget I was there. I know because I have I'm giving away my secrets. My son been, don't listen to this. Well, see, that's what I was going to ask. Like, I've not yet been on that side of it when you know the kid is like watching something. And you're like, oh shit, I forgot about that scene. Yeah. What do you do? How do you react? Oh, I said, I'm just like, cover your eyes. I'll tell you why. <laughs> okay. Like, okay. All right. Because I've been on the other side of it. I remember those days. <laughs> right, like, right, oh, yeah. yep. Well, uh, you can watch now. <laughs> Sproul, 2176, says, I love it. It was one of the best American jolly I can remember watching. So there you go. There Everybody's you go. making the connection to oh. the jolly. Yep. Uh, last week, we watched a movie called Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives. Mm-hmm. Pat Hetfield listened to our podcast and said, my favorite is Jason Goes to Hell. So I'm wrong Uh-oh. and proud of it. <laughs> well, Stand your ground, go. buddy. You Stand your ground. Be proud of it. Uh, Travis Legler says the reason C.J. Graham was hired was due to the original actor looking too big or thick and not like he was rotting away for a few years. Uh, yeah. Little did they know where they would go next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Simon Carter says all I have to say is gratuitous crunch shots. They really were. Yeah, they were. They really were. Were they gratuitous? They were integral to the plot. I think. Okay. okay it might be gratuitous. Uh, there were, all right, let's put there were two of them. I got after the first one. <laughs> right, you know. Uh, well, he also says, seriously, though, this is a fun entry to the franchise. Great Jason makeup and some good kills. I really like this version of Tommy Jarvis, too. Yeah, it was fun. Teresa Ann wonders, what were you going to be when you grew up? I think I asked somebody that this week. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to be? When, yeah, uh, from the kids from Friday the 13th, Part 6. Long, tall, shorty says, my absolute favorite Jason. I will never understand the praise that is constantly awarded to Kane Hodder, who starred in three of the absolute worst films in the series. Yeah, but he's a good Jason. Yeah. Like, just his breathing and his movements. Like, yeah, he's, he's just a, a good, good Jason. Like, we like the other Jasons, too, to lesser degrees, but he's just a... Yeah, he's, he's a, a good better Jason. Jason. He's a good Jason. Think, yeah, he's just in, he's in all the bad movies. He so. really yeah, is. That's Best Jason in the, that's <laughs> the first movies. But come on, look at part seven, Jason. Yeah, yeah, part seven days. That's pretty fucking, cool. fucking cool, Jason. Uh, RD sixty four one oh nine says, I recommend for you guys, since you're watching this, that it's another classic from Tom McLaughlin, A Date with an Angel. He wrote it, but the company didn't want to use it at first, 
But then a split well, when Splash came out. Uh, so they uh, rushed right. to get it made. Uh, after the movie was right. uh, released, yeah, because well, he basically, I think, said it was Splash with an angel. Right. So, yeah. I think we said that. Can we just we call did, it Splash yeah. with an angel? Yeah, we talked about that. Uh, about uh, the prior week's episode was Godzilla 1998. Richard Kratzer said, That's one big pile of fish, Sean, for the win. Oh, yeah. thank you, thank yeah. you. It was. Yeah. Uh, DJ Dog Manfish says, It's like the French soldiers eating gum to look more American, wearing berets. Makes you look more like you know what you're talking about. Are you sure? Well, I'm not. I'm not listening <laughs> to someone who's got a beret. I don't know. I mean, you have to, I think the accent makes him sound smarter. The beret is going to make me make fun of you. Yeah. I will not. We were wondering to why there were so many goddamn berets. In right. So many berets. Everyone's wearing them. Knit berets, regular berets. Yeah. Too many berets. Too many berets. Well, Jonathan Holt says, "I'm not going to lie, but for a good part of this episode, I thought, quote unquote, Joe was Sean doing a bit." <laughs> You do sound very much alike. When you listen to that episode back, it's like, oh man, they do sound like there the same are some, person. It didn't help that we both went into a Schwarzenegger presentation at some point <laughs> together. So we were really, yeah, probably confusing the audience at that point. Yeah. Joe's very real. Sean's very real. I both, I love them both dearly. That's right. We brought in There's our, no proof of this. our Godzilla <laughs> expert uh, for that episode. Okay, so now we're going to go around the... Oh, and thank you very much, everybody, for writing in. We're going oh, yes, around, thank you. around yeah, the thank table you. and... Uh, My favorite part. Give you our thoughts on tonight's movie, Dress to Kill, starting with Sean. I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know the uh, work of Brian De Palma very well. I'm just now like starting to get into it. I borrowed a couple movies from Colin. I'm watching this tonight. Um, so I want to explore more. Um, I mean, based on this tonight, like I think I have good reason to explore more. I like this movie. Um, I think it's shot great. Like I think this is a, a, a beautiful movie to watch. There are certain scenes in this that are also just beautiful in what they accomplished. Like we said, there's a mini movie in the middle of this, a mini silent film. Um, again, we talked about how the uh, the language for transgender people is obviously dated in this movie, but I don't think I think that's a a small thing to get past in this movie. They don't make it a big they don't make it problematic. I don't think. Like I mean, it is obviously it's 1980 and it is obviously not the way we think anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not their, like, I don't think it's their, like, sticking point in this movie. I don't know. Um, but I did like it. I think it's, uh... They don't, they don't make it seem like they're shaming him for being transgender. It's just they're... Right. They're talking about how, like, his mental capacity couldn't handle that, that's, the inner struggle. That right, that is through. the focus yeah. of it. Which I, I, I like. I like that they yes. weren't blaming him for that. Right. Yeah, because yeah, oh. even at the end, the uh, uh, Keith Gordon character is more intrigued by the idea right. Right. than, you know. Right. right. Um, and so, uh, I mean, this is, we, I mean, we've been lamenting the uh, movies for adults. Instead of saying adult movies, let's say that. Movies for adults. <laughs> movies for grown-ups. Movies for grown-ups. And, I, th I mean, this is that movie. It's one of the movies we've been looking for. I mean, it's sexy, which is, you know, always uh, fine with me. Uh, it looks great. I think the acting's great. Like, I had fun with, uh, even though he's a fucking asshole, Dennis Franz is like a fucking New York cop. I mean, that, I mean, so much so as to look at what his career has been. He's an asshole, but it's like comedic. It is. Yeah. And, he, and he comes off a little, uh, the, they shave off some of the edges in the last scene where they're all together. It's like, well, I didn't think he killed her, but we had to keep <laughs> it going so you could believe me to some certain things, which is, it's, it's tricky. But, I mean, it's. Um, what do you think I'm crude? All right, who you fucking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who you fucking? Yeah. It's, that was great. Yeah, it's there's some there's some really good stuff in this. Nancy Allen's doing really great. Like, um, I haven't seen much of her younger in roles. I think she's really good. Golden Globe nominated for this she role. She was dating Brian De Palma. Was she? Yeah. Ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> um, she did, but Carrie. she did great. Yeah, okay. yeah she did great. Yeah, she did great. Um, like that's fine. Yeah. She did great, so we'll give it to her. Um, but yeah, I, I think the acting's really good in this. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this movie. Uh. I don't know the difference between this and the unrated. I'll just say go with the unrated because that's what we watch tonight, <laughs> and it is a much much sexier pino uh, pino pino uh, much sexier movie. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was good. Uh, I'm gonna give it a full uh, full recommend. Dress to kill, Brian. Hi. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I really enjoyed this movie. I honestly had no idea what we were getting into. None, which no is idea. probably the best. Yeah, way I, didn't, I, didn't I didn't watch a trailer. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read anything anyone no. wrote in. I knew nothing about this movie, so I think that's that's a good way to go into it. Um, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. This was this had me hooked. I was I was yeah. into this movie. How like, long is this? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at yeah, it. Yeah, whatever it is, it didn't hours. feel like it. 105 like, minutes didn't feel okay. like it. Felt good. Like, like at one point, I was like, okay, this is kind of long, but I'm okay with it. Like, I'm, I'm into this movie. I'm into the thriller. And he takes his time, and that yeah. may be the reason. Like, there are s- slower moments, but he yeah. also just takes his time with the regular moments, and like, I like that. Yes, yeah, everything is is breathes intentional. You know, with sexy breathing. Yeah. I, yeah. And you know, obviously, there was lots of talk about uh, about Hitchcock and whether he's ripping them off or not. I'm like, nowadays everything is is derived from something, and I feel like when there's a certain level of artistry to it, I don't look at it as like a copycat anymore. You know, I don't look at it as like if it's total shit and it's like there's no skill behind it, then yeah, I'd be like, well, you're just fucking ripping off Hitchcock. But this, there's like actual skill behind it. There's there's intention behind the shots, and there's there's it's thought out, and I, I don't see it as a ripoff. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's very clearly De Palma, even if it's a borrowed narrative, you know. Um, and I like his interpretation, you know. Maybe I think that's what a lot of a lot of film is. It's it, maybe you are borrowing from someone else, but you're interpreting what you got from them. And I think that's what this is, and I think it's really I, I love this. I thought it was great. It was a pleasant, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie. Mm-hmm. It was a good one. Um, definitely in a, a grown-up movie. Yeah. Grown-up theme. I love me an erotic thriller. So, yeah, I'm going to give it two thumbs up. Definitely recommend. You should watch Dress Kill, and I agree with Sean. We watched the unrated. Yeah. So that's what you should watch. Two, two erect <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> two erect thumbs up. Two erect thumbs up. Very much so. That doesn't tell you to watch it on the moment. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm surprised. I really don't know if I have a whole lot to add. I mean, you know, you guys have pretty much summed it up. I think uh, I, I'm I'm kind of surprised that it feels like the awareness of this movie isn't as high as I expect that it would be. Yeah. I think this is, you know, it's like there's Carrie and there's Dress to Kill, you know, in that area of uh, uh, Brian De Palma's I career. Think the material may have tamped it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, what it, the subject matter it deals with. Really, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it censors it. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, like to its audiences, I mean. Like, I think Carrie is more widely watched because the content is more accepted. Right. And we're that also, makes sense? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we're also not trying to get telekinetic people in like into our like right yeah you know what I'm saying right. yeah. yeah oh yeah shit I forgot he did the fury right before this uh, <laughs> there's also a telekinetic people somebody blows up real good at the end of that Ooh, movie nice there you go. um and Kirk Douglas is in that movie um uh, the uh yeah I mean I think uh you know I mean I've, I've been moaning about this on several past podcasts it's like I don't think they make uh, choice of words right choice. Is, is the right <laughs> choice of be words moaning, I think be moaning be moaning well, I mean, yeah, there yeah, you go that's yeah. good yeah. Moaning, I've been moaning about the, the lack line. of uh, you know like <laughs> movies for adults I think and you know uh, and not only in the amount of you know that it's about you know uh, sex drives and you know and then it, it involves uh, nudity but it's there's like you have to be an adult, I think, in a lot of ways, like understand uh, some of the complexities of the motives. Yes. Uh, that I think is like you know that you know uh, right now that's catnip to me. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> give me a movie that like I understand that like, oh these are human beings doing you know even no matter how messy that you know uh, is like give me recognizable human beings. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think there's anybody, like, I mean, I would, I guess, say that, you know, he, uh, De Palma, to me, was the progeny of, of Hitchcock. Is he ripping them off? I don't know. It feels like these are the movies that Hitchcock would make, uh, you know, mm-hmm. in that era. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, because, you know, they shared, like I said before, I think that the two guys share similar interests. Um, and they're using a similar language. I think, yeah, De Palma is a better filmmaker than Dario Argento. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's not a, a necessarily slight. I mean, those are like the two guys. And there's Hitchcock, Brian De Palma, Dario Argento, right? Yeah. If you're into that kind of mm-hmm. uh, filmmaking. Um, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, I can't undersell how much I thought that Angie Dickinson's performance, even though she's in, you know, uh, a, a small amount of the movie, is like really fine tuned. Where you yeah. imagine that, like the conversations that had to happen between director and actor in those scenes, 
were extremely specific and dialed in. I mean, it's like it, it like that's a great performance, mm-hmm. I think, and it's a lot of it's wordless, you yeah. know. But I yeah. know what she's feeling at every like shot, and she and yeah. it's changing. You know, there's dynamics, there's character dynamics you happening see there. See the complexity. Yeah. The reason you're like, I don't know what she's feeling is because she doesn't know what she's feeling. Yeah, but yeah. you you get that yeah. sense even. I mean, it's like really, uh, it's really like a, a tour de force. I think you know, in like a director's career, uh, that's like a that is a great uh, a sequence. Yeah. And I think you know when I was going back and rewatching a bunch of Hitchcock movies, the scene that it most reminded me of was there's a similar. Well, no, it's not even similar, but. Uh, Jimmy Stewart's going after Pat uh, no, uh, Novak in a in Vertigo mm-hmm. through like a garden. The garden think, scene, yeah, the yeah. garden scene, and I'm like, is that the inspiration for the Probably. you know, <laughs> it, you know, yeah. it, it turns out different and all that stuff. But there's like you right. know the camera movements and stuff like that. I was like, yeah. oh, this is like you know. Um, so um, and I'm just gonna say, Wes Craven was influenced for Scream Two, and that's it. <laughs> I'm just gonna claim that right now, just for that one scene in the in the booth. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, I mean, that's in the, but those are, these are, this is the language of, of cinematic suspense, you know? Yeah. And uh, there's some people who do it well. Brian De Palma is one of the best. That's a very well. Uh, yeah. And I think Dress to Kill is one of uh, the crowning achievements in his, uh, like, what, 40 year career. And I think uh, definitely uh, you have to check it out. Uh, that's, a, I guess, a, a, a freak show recommended yeah. all around. Yep. You have to watch. Have to. That's the rules. That's the rule. You gotta watch Drastic Kill. So now, uh, we're gonna tell you the next week we're gonna watch a movie that's chosen by... Sean! What are we watching next week? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna go classy again. Okay. And by that I mean not at all. Alright. <laughs> there it is. Uh, we're gonna be watching Eight-Legged Freaks. Spider. All right. <laughs> Giant spiders. Giant spiders. Next week. You know, I have it on the last uh, spider movie that we watched. What was the last spider movie we watched? Arachnophobia. No, it wasn't. Was it? The Kingdom of the Spider. Oh, fuck. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I have our nails. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Eight Legged Freaks is next week on Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.